Martha had a sister named Mary. Speak these words in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This week in the Marsh House, baby Cyrus turns one. It is a big event because we are witnessing a new dynamic in our household as Cyrus and his three-year-old brother, Bradford, have started to become friends and rivals. The moments of friendship are heartwarming and the moments of rivalry are downright scary. There are many days that our living room feels like a World Cup soccer match as an accidental bump or just a touch sends the other person flying to the floor screaming and crying and causing foul or injury. For better or for worse, the sibling dynamic is alive in our household and it will be for the rest of our lives. My mother says it doesn't matter how many years have passed or the type of education we have received or the careers that we have chosen or the fact that we are now married with children because when my sister and I sit down at that kitchen table, the dynamics remain the same. Think about the last time your family gathered for a wedding or a funeral or a health crisis. I imagine some form of sibling dynamic was at play. Understanding sibling dynamics is important because today's gospel is about two sisters in the midst of conflict. And Jesus does something that no one should do. He gets in between them. He enters the family conflict and he starts taking sides. What in the world is he thinking? What is so important that you would put yourself between two sisters in the midst of a fight? Both sisters are standing on solid ground. Martha prioritizes excellence in hospitality, while Mary emphasizes grace. Martha prioritizes excellence and hospitality while Mary emphasizes grace. And Martha's emphasis on hospitality is based upon the Hebrew Scriptures. For example, Genesis 18 is the story of Abraham and Sarah showing hospitality to the three strangers. Genesis 43 is about Joseph showing hospitality to his brothers who left him for dead. Exodus 2 is the story of Moses fleeing the Pharaoh after killing the Egyptian soldier and receiving hospitality from a priest in Midian. Joshua 2 is a story about the Israelite soldiers who sneak into Jericho and receive hospitality and protection from none other than a prostitute named Rahab. Hospitality. But Martha also knows that Jesus talks about hospitality. Just last week, we heard the story of the Good Samaritan providing hospitality to the stranger. A few weeks ago, we heard the story of a sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with an expensive oil. An extreme example of hospitality. And later in Luke's Gospel, we encounter Zacchaeus up there in that tree, And Jesus says, come on down, Zacchaeus, so that I may stay at your house. And Zacchaeus extends hospitality. And his life is changed. Martha is trying to practice the virtue of hospitality. And she believes that Mary should do the same. And then there's her sister, Mary. Like all siblings, she grew up in the same household. She heard the same scriptures, but she gravitates toward grace. She hears the psalm, Be still, be still and know that I am God. 
So she sits at Jesus' feet. It's possible that Mary heard those words, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So she sat and she listened. Perhaps this dinner isn't much different from the dinner we see in John's Gospel, where Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My own peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Mary is drawn to the grace of Christ, so she stops to listen. So both Mary and Martha are justified in their positions. So why does Jesus say that Mary has chosen the better part? And what does that mean for us today? Why is that so important? Well, it comes down to the fact that Martha has separated excellence and hospitality from God. She loses sight of the most important thing. Because in order to provide excellence and hospitality, it involves being a servant. And being a servant involves being in relationship with the servant of all. It involves taking nourishment from the grace of Christ. The cathedral has three words that Dean Candler uses over and over again. If you've been on staff five years like me, you've heard them countless times, and I'm sure many of you have heard them as well. They are the words grace, excellence, and hospitality. Grace, excellence, and hospitality. These are the cathedral's guiding principles, and notice how they play out in today's lesson. Martha, excellence and hospitality. Mary, grace. Now we all know it has been a crazy week in Atlanta and in the world. Earlier this week, our neighborhood, this neighborhood right here, was filled with protesters. Like Martha, they were anxiously marching in order to create a community of excellence and hospitality. Globally, we've witnessed another act of terrorism with rising instability in the Middle East. And the Marthas of this world have reason to be anxious because hospitable communities are being threatened. The Marys. The Marys are looking out upon the community and the world, and they are wanting us to sit at the feet of Jesus and to receive the message of grace, to receive the peace that passes all understanding. And I get, I get where both of them are coming from. But trust me, trust me, it won't be long before the Marthas and the Marys start fighting. And here's how this will ultimately play out. The Marthas will eventually run out of gas, they'll run out of energy, they'll lose focus, and the Marys will never seem to get anything done. That is why Jesus gets in the middle of this argument between these two sisters. Jesus wants us to see that all three are needed. Grace excellence, and hospitality. If you were to step back and look at the history of Christianity, you will see that communities of grace, excellence, and hospitality have a way of changing the world. The disciples knew this. They knew that in order for Christianity to spread, it was going to take more than Billy Graham preaching. That wasn't going to get the job done. So they created koinonia, holy communities, churches founded upon grace, excellence, and hospitality. And the gospel began to spread. Or just look at Atlanta's own Martin Luther King Jr. He knew that in order for segregation to end, he needed more than just a protest. He needed more than just voices. So he cast a vision of beloved community. A community grounded in grace, excellence, and hospitality. 
It was a vision for the civil rights movement. Or look at the church in Germany, in the midst of Nazi Germany, in the midst of all that evil. Dietrich Bonhoeffer challenged the German church to articulate something more than just Luther's theology of grace. Grace wasn't just enough. Bonhoeffer challenged the church to become a community grounded in grace, yes, but also in excellence and hospitality. He gave the church a new vision, and it started a movement. This is why Jesus gets in the middle of this fight between these two sisters. There is something very important at stake. There is something that we need to hear. And it's something that we can do to change our current situation. We can create communities based upon grace, excellence, and hospitality. Like Martha and Mary, we are called to bring these values into our homes, to make them a part of who we are, to make them a part of how we treat others and bring those values. Bring those values into the classroom, into the office, into your social circles. The Cathedral of St. Philip strives to be a community of grace, excellence, and hospitality. We invite you to live by those values, to spread those values to Atlanta and to the world. Because we live in a moment in time that needs all three of those. Grace, excellence, and hospitality. Amen.